dive into the chilling depths of history as we unveil the cryptic tales behind Mary Mary Quite Contrary, an age-old English nursery rhyme that conceals a tapestry of secrets. Emerging from the shadows in 1744, within the pages of Tom Thumb's pretty songbook, this seemingly innocent verse hides a far more sinister past, intertwined with torture, murder and other macabre mysteries. Prepare to be captivated as we peel back the layers of time to expose the spine-tingling origins of this baffling rhyme, where darkness and intrigue converge in a dance of whispers and blood-curdling secrets. Welcome back, Darklings, to The Resurrectionists, where we breathe life into history, delve into ghostly realms, and explore everything that goes bump in the night. If you haven't joined our weird and wonderful family yet, hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell, because trust us, you won't want to miss a single spine-chilling update. Nursery rhymes harbour more than meets the eye. Far from child's play, many originated during eras when literacy was rare, serving as a covert means to chronicle significant political events and scandalous intrigues. Mary Quite Contrary is no exception. Yet, amid diverse theories, the identity of the enigmatic Mary remains a puzzle. One prevailing notion is tied to Mary Queen of Scots, tracing the origins of the rhyme back to her tale. Mary's reign over Scotland spanned from 1542 to 1567, a period marked by her distinct position as a Catholic queen in a predominantly Protestant nation. Within the lines of a seemingly innocent nursery rhyme, hidden layers of symbolism start to emerge. The phrase, how does your garden grow, has been interpreted as a nod to the lush Scottish landscapes under her rule. The term silver bells finds resonance in Catholic cathedral chimes, while cockle shells potentially mocks the decorations on a dress gifted to her by the French king, her ornate Catholic attire becoming a target for Protestant disdain. The line, pretty maids all in a row, may subtly reference her loyal ladies-in-waiting, a quartet that accompanied her through the French court and upon her return to Scotland. However, an early version of the rhyme concludes with a different last line which reads, Sing cuckolds all a row, which presents a darker and more mysterious tone into the narrative. The term cuckold carries derogatory implications, insinuating a husband with an adulterous wife or unknowingly raising children who aren't his own. This line casts a provocative shadow upon Mary's romantic chronicles, potentially referencing her reputation as a hot-blooded enchantress. In the grand courts of France, Mary's life seemed destined for fairy tale bliss as she married Francis II, the King of France. Yet fate had other plans, and their union was cut short when Francis died just two years later, plunging her into a whirlwind of uncertainty. Returning to her native Scotland, Mary's life took an unexpected turn as she crossed paths with the charismatic and fiery Lord Darnley, Henry Stuart their union ignited like a tempestuous blaze, fueled by a potent mix of passion and power. But the flames that burned between them cast doubtful shadows, revealing a stormy relationship fraught with struggles for dominance. While Mary was open to co-ruling Scotland alongside her husband, Darnley harboured grandiose aspirations, expecting Mary to relinquish her sovereign authority to him and act as his subordinate. Within months, the fiery affection that had united them turned into seething resentment. Love had curdled into hatred, shattering the illusions of their once enviable bond. Lord Darnley, a young man fueled by his own desires, indulged in heavy drinking and infidelity, his heart straying to various lovers, even to a young and captivating man named David Rizzio. Yet the story took a dramatic twist, as Rizzio, once entwined with Lord Darnley, found his heart captured by none other than Mary herself. Rumours whispered of a secret, passionate affair between the Queen and her charming secretary, painting their connection with forbidden colours. The court buzzed with speculation, and as Mary's belly swelled with the promise of a future king, whispers grew louder that Rizzio might actually be the true father. Jealousy seized hold of Lord Darnley, setting the stage for a sinister plot that would alter the course of history. Together with his father, he hatched a scheme to rid himself of Rizzio once and for all, a treacherous plan with the ultimate goal of manipulating Mary into surrendering her crown to Darnley. In the shadowed cloak of night, on the fateful date of March the 9th, 1566, a palpable tension gripped the palace of Holyrood House. The air was thick with malevolent forces, as Lord Darnley's assembly, 
a gathering of around 80 conspirators navigated the hallowed corridors of the palace under the guidance of their enigmatic leader, Lord Rufin. Their destination? The Queen's supper chamber, where an unsuspecting Mary reveled in the company of friends, including Rizzio. As the grand doors creaked open, Lord Rufin materialised at the forefront, clad in armour, his presence emanating an air of foreboding. In a sombre tone, Rufin accused Rizzio of dishonouring the Queen, setting the stage for a dramatic confrontation. Mary, no stranger to the art of diplomacy, attempted to defuse the situation. She urged Rufin to leave, reasoning that any grievance involving Rizzio should be weighed by the Lords of Parliament. Alas, her plea was met with cold indifference, and Rufin drew his dagger as the room simmered with tension. In a blaze of fury, Mary rose, her anger a tempestuous force colliding with the encroaching darkness. Rizzio cowered behind her, a man ensnared in the midst of a plot far beyond his comprehension. Mary's friends lunged to shield their sovereign, grappling with Rufin, but it was no use. In a torrent of terror and confusion, Rizzio was wrestled into the adjoining room. Mary could only watch on in horror, the cold metal of a pistol pressed against her, a reminder of her vulnerability and powerlessness. In the adjoining chamber, a grim scene of vengeance and savagery unfolded. Rizzio, ensnared within the clutches of his assailants, was subjected to a cruel and relentless attack. Amid his chilling cries, an orchestra of blades pierced Rizzio's flesh an unfathomable 56 times. The scene unfolded like a nightmarish symphony, a tableau of horror that left no room for respite. And in the chilling crescendo, Lord Darnley's dagger, wielded by an assassin, delivered the final damning blow. The lifeless vessel of the once vibrant Rizzio was unceremoniously stripped of his fine clothes and hurled down the palace stairs, a chilling testament to the depths to which human greed and treachery could plummet. Surprisingly, this chilling drama doesn't reach its conclusion here. Merely a year later, Lord Darnley met a mysterious and suspicious demise that continues to puzzle historians even today. In the cold early hours of February 10th, 1567, a chilling plot unfolded on the cobblestone streets of Edinburgh. The ominous shadow of the old provost's house of Kirko Field, nestled in the heart of the Royal Mile, concealed a tale of intrigue, betrayal and unspeakable horror. Lord Darnley had sought refuge within the walls of Kirko Field, weakened by illness. Unbeknownst to him, this sanctuary was gradually being transformed into a death trap. An unseen enemy, lurking in the shadows, was orchestrating a malevolent scheme. As the clock struck 2am, the silence of the night was pierced by an earth-shattering explosion that rippled through the very fabric of Edinburgh. Kirko Field erupted into a fiery inferno, its walls crumbling into dust. Amid the chaos and debris, the lifeless form of Lord Darnley was discovered in a neighbouring garden, his body sprawled beside that of his loyal groom. However, all was not as it seemed. Intriguingly, their lifeless forms were strangely undamaged by the raging explosion, leaving behind a trail of questions and speculative theories about their final moments. Historian Magnus Magnusson recounted how Lord Darnley's lifeless form bore evidence of strangulation, hinting that death had come before the cataclysmic explosion. What if a disturbance had jolted Darnley awake, compelling him to make a desperate escape attempt with his loyal attendant before being discovered by their enemies? A chair and rope were also found in the garden close to the men. Could they have aided their attempted escape through a window on the upper floor? Was the explosion that followed a crescendo of chaos, orchestrated to veil their murders, an eerie cover for a sinister act? Queen Mary mourned her husband for forty days, yet whispers drifted through the city's taverns and winding alleys, painting her grief as a mask for darker truths. Was she truly innocent? or was she herself responsible for her husband's suspicious death? In the labyrinth of suspicion, the Earl of Bothwell emerged as a name that would forever be entwined with the horrors of that night. A man of power and shadows, rumours swirled that he had supplied the very gunpowder that ignited the explosion, and a pair of shoes belonging to one of his supporters were found at the scene of the crime. In a matter of days, vibrant placards adorned the streets, while leaflets circulated through Edinburgh. 
these boldly pointed fingers at Mary, Queen of Scots, and James Hepburn, 4th Earl of Bothwell, alleging an illicit love affair and their involvement in orchestrating Darnley's murder. The stage shifted yet again on the 24th of April, 1567. It is said that on a desolate road between Linlithgow Palace and Edinburgh, Bothwell and his legion of 800 men confronted Mary herself. Whispered words of danger fell from his lips, a warning that the tides of treachery were once more poised to swallow Mary in Edinburgh. With an air of foreboding, he urged her to seek protection in his own castle, Dunbar, an offer that hid sinister intentions. Midnight descended as Mary stepped into the jaws of a trap. Within the walls of Dunbar Castle, a nightmarish ordeal awaited her. Bothwell, his intentions as dark as the night itself, took her captive. Allegations of coercion and a twisted power play coloured the night's events, all designed to lead Mary down a path she could not escape. The days that followed saw a spectacle of manipulation and political manoeuvring, as the ink on his divorce papers from Jean Gordon, Countess of Bothwell, had barely dried, he claimed Queen Mary as his own. Their marriage took place on the 15th of May, 1567, just three months after Lord Darnley's death. The intentions and circumstances of these events weave a complicated web of intrigue that has divided historians across the ages. Was Mary truly an unfortunate victim, ensnared within the confines of a patriarchal era, coerced into a marriage with Bothwell against her desires? Or do the shadows cast a different tale, that of a shrewd and calculating figure willing to trade her second husband's life for a promise of future matrimony to Bothwell? While historical fragments provide a canvas, they offer only hints of the complex portrait painted upon it. Unravelling the truth requires a delicate interplay of conjecture and scrutiny, a journey into the corridors of history that holds neither a single answer nor a clear path. Stories of Mary's scandal-laden romantic affairs ignited a public sensation at the time, making it entirely plausible to speculate that the Mary Mary quite contrary nursery rhyme finds its roots in the captivating tapestry of her life. The tale of Rizzio's murder, Lord Darnley's death, Queen Mary's descent into Bothwell's grasp, and the chilling echoes of those turbulent days continue to captivate, to intrigue, and to remind us that even within the most regal corridors, the shadows hold secrets that defy the passage of centuries. However, there exists a belief that the rhyme may allude to a different Mary from the same era, Mary Tudor, known by the chilling moniker Bloody Mary. Born of the union between Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon, her life became a tapestry of intrigue, betrayal and a thirst for power. Mary sought to dismantle the foundations of the Church of England, striving to reclaim the Catholic faith that had been cast aside. It was a gambit to regain her mother's legacy, a path that ultimately led to a reign drenched in terror. The rhyme speaks of her being contrary, which could represent the paradox capturing the dual nature of her rule, a queen seeking salvation while sowing the seeds of dread. The line, how does your garden grow, is a question that extends beyond the surface. In one interpretation, it speaks of her desperate yearning for a child. At the age of 38, she married King Philip II of Spain, driven by a deep urgency to secure an heir. As time passed, whispers spread about Mary's pregnancy, conveyed through private letters that detailed the growth of her belly and the sensation of a baby's movements. In the early days of May 1555, a rumour ignited like wildfire, news that the Queen had given birth, prompting widespread celebrations in London and the surrounding areas, marked by bonfires and unrestrained joy. However, reality shattered this illusion just days later, revealing the rumour as false. Unyielding, Mary clung to a belief that her child's birth was imminent, and issued a statement that God would not allow her child to be born until all the Protestant dissenters were punished, beginning another round of executions. Yet despite the fervour, the cries and the whispers, the promised heir never came. Another interpretation sees the darkness run even deeper still. For the garden in the rhyme could just as easily refer to a graveyard, where each of Mary's executions fertilises the earth with its dark harvest. The whispers of history suggest that the remainder of the rhyme's cryptic imagery holds a key to her reign of terror. Silver bells could be a chilling metaphor for the torment inflicted upon her victims, invoking the image of thumbscrews, 
cockle shells, a sinister representation of genital torture, and the pretty maids in a row, referencing a grim procession leading to the ominous embrace of the maiden, an executioner's tool of choice. It's a macabre picture, each line unravelling a dark truth hidden in history's shadows. Though intriguing, this theory might be deemed unlikely, as Mary was known to favour burning Protestants at the stake for execution, with little evidence to support the notion that her victims endured the torture devices mentioned in the rhyme. Mary Tudor, a woman entwined in the threads of power and pain, navigated a treacherous landscape where ambition and cruelty walked hand in hand. The rhyme's layers of meaning reflect the complexity of her legacy, a queen of paradoxes, a ruler of shadows, and a figure whose name has become synonymous with a reign of terror, forever etching her place in the history books. Which of these theories do you find most convincing? Or perhaps you have your own ideas? We're eager to hear from you, so leave us a comment. If you enjoyed this glimpse into the origins of Mary Quite Contrary, hit that like button, and please don't hesitate to share which nursery rhyme you'd like us to explore next. Stay tuned, because the adventure doesn't end here. We have more chilling tales, haunting history and strange practices to uncover in future videos. Until then, keep venturing into the unknown, unearthing spine-chilling facts and feeding your insatiable curiosity. See you in a future video.